All right, so I will uh, get going. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Francesca Ferlaino. But I will uh, first remind listeners of a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, let me invite you to ask questions of the speaker during the talk. Uh, you can enter these questions either on the Zoom uh, Q&A function or in the online chat on our YouTube stream. And just remember that the YouTube stream is a little bit delayed, so don't wait to the last minute to enter your questions there. Uh, there will be two breaks for questions during the talk. Um, second, let me remind you to uh, consider attending the post-seminar discussion with our speaker. This is uh, particularly valuable for the students and the postdocs in our audience. It gives you a chance to have more face time with the speaker, to get to know her better, to ask detailed questions, but also to get to know one another. So this is something that you would normally be doing at conferences during this uh, time, but uh, since we can't travel, we have to find other ways to get to know each other. So come to that post-seminar discussion, turn on your video so we can see you and please participate. So now let me uh, introduce today's speaker, uh, who is one of my uh, most esteemed colleagues uh, and also a friend, Francesca Ferlaino. I've known Francesca since she was a graduate student at the University of Florence um, within the group of Massimo Angusio. Uh, when she was there, she performed some of the first experiments on ultra-cold uh, Fermi-Bose mixtures and also on uh, fermionic gases and optical lattices. Uh, this was a, a very productive uh, time scientifically and very visible. And so she and I had a lot of discussions at that early time at conferences that we both attended. Uh, Francesca then moved to the University of Innsbruck in 2006, uh, first supported there by Lise Meitner Postdoctoral Fellowship. Uh, she began there by working with Rudy Grimm and uh, Christoph Negerl on some great experiments that explored Feshbach resonances in ultracold cesium and in rubidium cesium mixtures. The products of that effort are a, uh, a delectable stew of few body physics. Uh, they covered uh, extremely weakly bound molecules, molecule-molecule uh, collisions, and the first observation of FMOF trimers. Um, Francesca elected to stay in Innsbruck and she established her own research group there beginning in 2009. Uh, she is now a professor of physics at the University of Innsbruck and also a research director at ECOKI, which is the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information there. Her group focuses on studies of few and many body quantum phenomena in ultra-cold lanthanide gases, including erbium and now also erbium dysprosium mixtures. Um, in normal times before COVID, when I uh, travel uh, quite a bit to interact with uh, people in the international scientific community, I seem to run into uh, Francesca quite often. Uh, for the reason that her group is always producing amazing results. Uh, dipolar effects in Fermi gases, uh, magnetic supersolids, uh, chaotic Feshbach resonances, self-bound gas droplets, and so on. So she's always out there communicating these results and delivering new surprises. Um, I'll share one anecdote. At one of these meetings, Francesca shared with me some very frightening news. Uh, in her position at the University of Innsbruck, she now had to teach courses in physics, but moreover, she had to teach them in German. O.M. Gott, that was a big challenge, but she overcame that challenge like she has uh, any other challenge that was put in her way. So let me welcome Francesca to the Vamos seminar, and Francesca, you have license to speak in uh, any language you wish. Okay, then thanks a lot for this very, very nice presentation. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, it's, um, it's, it's really incredible what you have done all together to put together this series of, uh, of virtual seminar. And I think it's, uh, it's a big effort to keep us together and to keep us alive and so Thank you very, very much for, for doing this. And um, yeah, and so I'm looking forward. For me, it's the first time online and uh, I, will, uh, I will try to see how it goes. So um, maybe I, I will now share the video. And since I have some um, internet connection problem, I will switch off the, um, the video. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yes. So. I hope you see 
see my video? Yes, we see your screen. Yeah, my screen, exactly. So, so in the talk of to, a little bit what was going on in, um, in ultra cold dipolar quantum gas in the last, I would say, two years, because that's really a very exciting story. We learned a lot uh, and there was a lot of kind of feedback between different experimental group, different theoretical group. I mean, there, we had really the feeling to work together and uh, to try together uh, to understand how this uh, new type of, of quantum gases are behaving. And especially the, the topic I would like to focus today is about super solidity. And so this is a, a very special state of matter. Of course, you, you know that there are a quantum phase of matter okay, um, in different states. So you can have, for example, superconductivity in solid or superfluidity like in helium, uh, uh, in helium superfluid, but also I mean uh, quantum gases uh, with uh, all the different phases uh, and a very rich phase diagram, depending on how they are prepared. And also you can have quantum fluid of light. So those are just example of, uh, of state that you can achieve, but there is uh, many more other state which kind of uh, break a little bit the state of matter classification. And with state of matter classification, I, I meant, I mean, a classification between solid, liquid, gas. And one of the very, I would say, intriguing example is this super solid. The super solid uh, is, uh, is a new state that it's kind of sharing properties of solid and superfluid is superfluid liquid so it's kind of a me and it's uh, it was predicted uh, uh, theoretically first as uh, really it was almost an oddity because it's a sort of a paradoxical state in which you you have at the same time the rigidity of a crystal but and uh, properties of superfluid uh, flow and what I'm now putting together is a, an additional oddity because now we have the rigidity of a solid flowing as a superfluid and maybe the state exists in a gas. So, and that's the reason why when we had to think about uh, an artistic view of this state was, was extremely difficult. So how to give the sense of uh, uh, solidity, crystalline structure, but at the same time flowing. And so we came up with a, uh, the idea of, of visualizing this state as the Greek, uh, um, let's say, uh, god uh, called And each phase represents a sort of uh, antithetical aspect. And in our case, is a, a fluid and, uh, and a crystal. And the interesting part is that you cannot destroy one of these two entities without destroying the full system. And so this is a bit the, the intuitive feeling that I would like to give you uh, about super solidity. So going back a little bit in the history, there was a, I mean, in condensed matter physics, uh, the question whether a solid can be superfluid. And so maybe a first answer to this question came from Penrose and uh, Osanger in uh, 56. And, uh, and the answer was sort of no because the um, localization that you would have in a solid that is a competing order with respect to this, uh, cannot, um, let's say, live together. However, so quite, let's say, just a few years after, there have been a number of very interesting theoretical papers from 57 by Gross and then going on with Young, Andre, Lifshitz, Chester, and Leggett, actually uh, questioning this view and, and pointing out that it might be that there are states which feature a crystalline order and a Bose Einstein condensation or superfluidity at the same time. So this type of um, um, prediction remained um, unobserved, I would say, for many, many years. And the first idea was to produce a solid, like helium solid, and see if this solid can become in special condition super solid. 
So having a fluid property added to the solid one. In 2004, with solid helium, there have been an, uh, a first paper by uh, Kim and Chan about the probable observation of super solid uh, helium phase. So this was really a beautiful experiment, uh, very difficult actually, and uh, it kind of triggered um, many, many researchers in the field that to try to reproduce the same experimental data and many theories to try to model what have been observed in the experiment. And actually, uh, it took some, a lot of work also by the author and many other in the community and about eight years to uh, come up to the conclusion that in this experiment, there was no super solidity. The effect, which was an anomalous moment of inertia was due to, let's say, other reason not related to super solidity. And so, and this was the path, the most, I would say, um, the first way But in helium, um, there is not too much to be tuned, uh, at least from the point of view of an ultra cold <laughs> gas uh, experimentalist, uh, where we can change many properties of the system. And so this was realized already by many theorists, uh, thinking that maybe one should use a completely different platform to try to observe super solidity. And so over the year, there have been really a realm of uh, very beautiful theory work. And here I'm listing some of the key author of those work, but there are many more. I'm sorry if I'm missing someone. And the idea was to start from a superfluid state and then to tune parameter, most probably the interaction, to reach the super solid. But um, for many years, it was not completely clear what is to reach super solidity. And many different platforms have been investigated. So like Rydberg uh, soft core interacting uh, uh, ultra cold gases, uh, dipolar quantum gases, or light couple BC or spin orbit couple BC. And in 2017, I've been there have been um, Tilman Esslinger working with light couple BC and the group of uh, Wolfgang Ketter and with spin orbit couple BC. And in both cases, they observed a state which had really a spontaneous uh, symmetry uh, breaking, uh, the translational symmetry, showing some crystalline feature. So and they provided some experimental evidence of super solid like properties. So the work which I'm focusing in is actually a little bit different because it's um, focusing on dipolar quantum gases. So quantum, the interaction between the particle um, are long range and um, anisotropic. And so I have to say uh, already from the beginning and you will see during the presentation that, that dipolar quantum gas are very fascinating and really in the last I would say three, four years, we learned enormously about the quantum phases of this system. And this learning process have been also very exciting with many um, discovered from the group of Tillman, Fau in Stuttgart, and then uh, later the group of Giovanni Modugno in Pisa and uh, our group in Innsbruck. And so the working all together on this very complex problem, I mean, have really speed up our mutual understanding. And, and today I can say that we have a pretty solid view of uh, what is the meaning of um, super solidity. Indeed, that uh, one now, after all our study and the theoretical uh, uh, study by um, our colleague, so we kind of uh, are able to trace a sort of route to super solidity. So that's the recipe, I would say, with the most important ingredient. So first, start with the superfluid state. And, this, uh, and the state should be composed of particles which interact between each other with a momentum dependent interaction. So contact type interaction with no momentum dependence will not be uh, suitable for super solidity. Then once you identify this type of state, um, there should be a mechanism in the system that spontaneously drive the system toward a sort of um, a crystallization instability. So there should be a specific uh, uh, wave vector and specific uh, uh, interaction parameter where the system try to um, a crystalline structure. 
But that's not enough because instability will bring you the system to collapse. So you also, one also need a, an additional mechanism, a kind, kind of protection mechanism, which let's say stabilize the system once it is very close to instability. And during my talk, I would like to go to this three uh, point and, uh, and show uh, you what I really mean with them. So I think one of the most, let's say, interesting uh, feature of dipolar quantum gas is this possibility to have a crystallization and an instability, which, uh, which is nothing else than the roton instability. And so once we think about instability towards crystallization, so we can go back to helium, which is a quantum fluid from which we, we learn of uh, phenomena. And so in, uh, 40, in 41 and then later in 47, Landau predicted that many of the special thermodynamic properties of helium, how it flow and how it behave is related to its spectrum of excitation. And the spectrum, I mean, is, um, is very peculiar and it's uh, coming out from the very, very strong interaction uh, between the, the, the atom. And so as you see, you can see that the spectrum of excitation, which is a, a type of dispersion, so it relates the energy to the momentum. There is a linear part, which is the phonon part, and then there is a maximum of the spectrum, and then there is a minimum, which occur at a specific value of the momentum. In helium, the existence itself of the minimum is due to the very strong interaction, as I said, and this min minimum occurs at the roton momentum, which is nothing else than the mean interparticle distance, which is nothing else as well than one over uh, the, um, the range of the interaction. And so this is very uh, peculiar because if we try to understand what is the meaning of this uh, minimum, it seems that if we give uh, high enough momentum, the system is more willing to be excited. So you need less energy to be excited than if you go to a lower momentum. And so this was predicted first in 41 and then in 47, and then observed uh, 65 years later or 50 years later in helium four and uh, 65 years later in helium three in really very beautiful experiment. And I think this data here is the experimental data from the paper of Glide et al. And so now to give you an intuitive feeling of what a phonon mode or phonon excitation and the roton one it is, uh, we can think about phonon excitation like excitation at small momentum, so very large wavelengths. And it's kind of a jelly that collectively move. So it's a, a linear dispersion is kind of like sound wave. And the roton instead is completely different because it's a very, is a very large momentum excitation, which means very short wavelengths. And it corresponds to, let's say, a density modulation within the system, like building up a periodic density structure, density modulation into the system. And, um, and there is kind of, of course, a quadratic dispersion. Now, what is also interesting is that, um, so Landau really um, predicted the, the existence of the roton in a very, I would say, empirical manner. And, uh, and it was amazing that after 50 years, actually, this could have, have been confirmed. The physical interpretation on what is the roton was, was really unclear at the time of Landau. So Landau called it this special excitation roton because he had the feeling that this might be related to uh, a vortex. So let's say, um, so, um, uh, let's say a ghost of a vortex line have been called it. But many, several years later, uh, Nozier pointed out that maybe the roton is more connected, uh, is more like the ghost of a Bragg spot. I mean, when I say Bragg spot, I mean, you know, when you do Bragg spectroscopy, it's to see the crystalline structure. So he kind of got the intuition that the roton excitation is related uh, to the tendency of the system to establish a local order and uh, to establish a, a type of crystalline instability into the system. Actually, if in helium we would increase the density, 
of the helium superfluid, the roton gap would uh, progressively close, but at some point the system uh, become a normal solid. Okay. And so this is a, a bit a challenge. And also it's very difficult in helium to change by a lot the density, the pressure into the system, let's say. And, um, and now <clears throat> in the same paper, Nozier also pointed out something which regard us more closely because it regards weakly interacting dilute gas, so our quantum gases. And he point out that actually there is no roton minimum in weakly interacting dilute gas. And so these are the reason for this thinking is that the interaction in these atoms are kind of contact type, but also too weak uh, to uh, make the appearance of a roton instability. And indeed, I mean, in, I'm showing you the measurement of the spectrum of excitation in, in rubidium back in 2002. And so here you see that the spectrum is a first phononic like sound wave, and then it becomes free particle like plane wave. And there is no such a roton minimum in the system. However, uh, so one year um, later, there have been paper by um, uh, Luis Santos and, uh, and then also paper by Odell showing that if the interaction between the atom is not only short range, but actually is uh, long range and an isotropic, like the dipole-dipole interaction, which is as a one over r to the cube dependence and also dependence on the angle, so how the dipole are aligned. In this case, this interaction is momentum dependent. So if you do the Fourier transform, there is a momentum dependence in the interaction. And if the interaction is present between the atom, the of excitation get really very much uh, modified. And now why, what is that done? At some value, uh, which is basically dictated by um, a competition of energy scale in the system. So the competition between the dipole-dipole interaction and the kinetic energy and the trapping energy and the contact interaction, in which the interaction become from repulsive, suddenly it can become attractive. And this competition of energy generate this type of dip in the spectrum, which is actually very similar to helium superfluid. Again, the roton gap can be tuned in several ways, can be tuned in the same way in helium, let's say, by increase changing the density, since it's due to many bad interaction, but it can also be uh, tuned by changing the scattering lens. And indeed, uh, if one has a system in which you have both contact interaction and dipole-dipole interaction, and one knows how to, let's say, tune the contact interaction by changing uh, the scattering lens, which is the main parameter for this interaction, then you can completely, let's say, modify the spectrum of excitation in a dipolar BC from a purely phononic one to kind of by decreasing the scattering lens and so making the importance of the dipole-dipole interaction always bigger. So you can, you know, you can start to make this roton minimum appearing and also to get it completely softened so that the roton gap close and the energy here it's zero. And so this prediction was done by Luis Santos in the case of dipolar quantum gas in 2003 and actually took 15 years uh, to be observed because to really have a spectrum like this you need pretty large dipolar interaction between the atom and so in the case of atom this means that the magnetic dipole moment should be large enough and uh, for many years, the only dipolar gas um, available in the community was chromium. I mean, there are fantastic experiments done with chromium, but somehow the magnetic moment was just not large enough comparing with the other energy scale of the system to really make the roton minimum visible. But then... <clears throat> Let's say back in uh, 2011, there have been the first uh, dysprosium Bose-Einstein condensate in the group of Benjamin Leff, and in 2012, uh, our group Bose condensed the erbium. So these atoms actually were magnetic enough uh, to give a chance to observe this effect. And now, I mean, it was um, actually a pretty long story on how we came up uh, in the lab really to observe the roton, but um, let me just showing some of the measurement uh, we have done. So 
An interesting way to probe the existence of the roton is, of course, to map the spectrum of excitation. And this can be done with the sort of two photon transition, which is called Bragg scattering. And this is what we have done. It's a little bit challenging because in the Bragg scattering, you need to change. And if you want to map for a large momentum range, the spectrum, uh, then you have to be able to change quite substantially, let's say the setting of the two laser beam uh, doing the Bragg spectroscopy. But at the end, also thanks to the digital mirror device that it's something now becoming very common in many labs, we were able to, to actually implement this, uh, uh, this Bragg spectroscopy. And so here it's the measurement. So this is the um, spectrum of excitation as a function of the momentum in some appropriate rescaling unit. And so when the scattering lens is large, the spectrum is, uh, is actually pretty linear, like phonon. But then when we start to decrease the scattering lens, we start to see a sort of um, deformation of the spectrum, bending a little bit down and then more down until it's kind of, um, really building up a sort of minimum. So I want to tell you that, of course, uh, uh, this uh, energy difference is, uh, is actually not very big. I mean, we are speaking about 100 Hertz. And so in the experiment, we have to face really a lot of challenging because the Bragg pulse itself, uh, uh, it's kind of uh, in general broad because of the duration of the pulse. There is the Fourier broadening that it's very, difficult to overcome, but still we were able really to see this deformation of the spectrum. And, um, and in all this state, and so in all this system, the, the ground state of our dipolar quantum gas is a normal Bose-Einstein condensate, not, not modulated. And, uh, and we were probing now roton gap was changing with the scattering lens. And here is now the roton gap in a unit of the, um, of the trap frequency. Uh, and you see that the roton gap at some point, at some value of the scattering length, very closely, very, very quickly close. And here is the interesting point because um, uh, when it close, then it means that there is no energy cost to create a roton excitation. And, uh, and so any little, uh, quantum or thermal um, fluctuation into the system, can, which see the little bit this state, uh, can then make, a, um, let's say, a macroscopic occupation of the roton mode because there is no energy to pay for this. And so what we would see in the system without any Bragg, uh, really just by you prepare a Bose-Einstein condensate of erbium or dysprosium, and then you change slowly the scattering lens to a point that the spectrum is completely uh, rotonized. And then you see, you would expect to see the spontaneous appearance of two additional peak in momentum space, one at uh, plus k rot, so here, and the other one at minus k rot. So momentum should be conserved. And, uh, and of course, since momentum and uh, uh, let's say uh, space uh, are connected by Fourier transform, the presence of a, a new momentum peak also correspond to the appearance of a density modulation in position space at a wavelength, uh, which is uh, one over the k rot or two pi over the k rot which in our case uh, is predicted to be much smaller than the system size. And so in, so in, in, in ultra cold gas experiment, the momentum distribution can be actually probed in after time of flight. And so, and there is this, uh, let's say completely, let's say symmetric picture that one can have. So short wavelengths density modulation in trap and the appearance of a roton peak. And, uh, and so now we did this experiment already back in 2018. And so when the scattering lens is fairly big, you just see uh, the momentum distribution of a dipolar Bose-Einstein condensate. But then at some point we, we started to decrease the scattering lens and at some point very abruptly, the system show the appearance of this side peak that I was mentioning before. And this is kind of the, the signal, let's say the fingerprint that the roton excitation have been uh, produced. And then uh, one can even go farther and the peak get uh, more populated. And so this now 
somehow raise a, an interesting point because we have now an instability towards crystallization. So there is no energy cost to create this excitation and the system do create the excitation. And actually within the Bogolyubov theory, the excitation are expected to, let's say exponentially increase. And this is why the system is expected to collapse. And so one possible view is about and soft and what happened is that the system really uh, collapse because of this uh, rotten instability. And another possibility is that actually the system undergo a phase transition to a new state. So now this looking at our data back in 2018, here this is the amplitude of the rotten mode, we saw this um, very fast uh, grow of the rotten population, let's say an exponential grow, as you would expect uh, when the system is going towards collapse. But then at some point the growth stopped and the, the, the rotten population undergoes a much slower dynamics. And at the, the time of 2018, we actually didn't really understood that. why. We thought it was maybe decrease of density due to three body losses, or maybe this was a, a, an entrance door to a new state, but we, we were actually not very sure about why there was this uh, longer times, lower dynamics uh, into the Roton uh, population. And, um, and here is where it enters uh, um, and the last very important ingredient, uh, which is this uh, protection mechanism against collapse. Because if there is any way that the exponential growth of excitation is stopped, in our case, I mean, you have to imagine that the modulation is start to increase more and more and to really have a density peak into the system. If there is a mechanism that stop the high density peak and stabilize, then the system would probably have the time to make a phase transition toward a new state. And actually, if you look at the Gross-Pitayevsky equation where you have kinetic energy, the trap, the mean field contact interaction, the dipole-dipole interaction, was realized that, and this all even in helium, in the helium droplet physics, it was realized that, that if you add a type of interaction which is dependent on density as the mean field interaction, but the dependence is a little bit faster than the mean field interaction, this type of term, repulsive of course, can stabilize the system. And, and it's amazing to see that uh, already a paper in 2015 from um, uh, Dima Petrov and Jora Shlapnikov, they really grasped the main physics behind uh, all this super solid. And in their case, they identified the mechanism of stabilization to be three body interaction, but actually, uh, parallel research in uh, dipolar quantum gas shows that dipolar quantum gas can have uh, another type of uh, uh, stabilization interaction or can have another type of interaction with, um, let's say, fast power law in density. And this was the result uh, obtained in a very different context and with very different trapping geometry, uh, first by the group of Tillman Fau, where he showed that the quantum fluctuation uh, can actually stabilize a structure into a dipolar quantum gas. And then later, both in my group and in the group of uh, Tillman Fau, it was also shown that actually um, it's possible to create a very dense uh, macro droplet uh, uh, with uh, ma a macro droplet, but the let's say the peak density is kind of regulated, stop it, like if there would be a cutoff by the quantum fluctuation, which are very well described in terms of the Li Wan Yang uh, term. And so it seems, uh, and now if you put all these ingredients together, that's how, let's say, a dipolar super solid from the physical point of view can be realized. And these have been uh, uh, realized, uh, so there have been um, um, a theoretical paper in 2019, and just I think uh, almost simultaneously in our lab and in the lab of uh, uh, Tillman Fau and in the lab of Giovanni Modugno, we were actually working on this possibility. And so maybe now I would like to make a first stop and to, to take question because this was more, let's say, a more theoretical uh, part. Uh,
Francesca, so I suggest you, you turn your video back off because uh, we really can't understand you with your with your video on. Uh, I think it's not enough bandwidth. Thank you. Uh, okay, so hopefully this will uh, work. Um, by the way, Francesca, I know um, a lot of our faces have disappeared during your talk. We're just trying to conserve bandwidth, but we're all paying rapt attention. Um, so there are a number of uh, questions that came up. Firstly, as you know, every time you give a talk, you will be faced by a question from Bill Phillips. Uh, and here you go. Um, could you perhaps distinguish between uh, rigidity as a solid property, which you talked about a bunch, but also periodicity or spatial symmetry breaking? So for example, can a super solid be amorphous instead of uh, periodic? Okay, <laughs> of course, as usual, very nice question. And um, so I think that um, is a little bit uh, questionable which type of definition one want to give about super solidity. And I think the, the very basic definition is that you have uh, the breaking of the translational symmetry. So sort of the appearance of density modulation, like uh, let's say a crystalline or periodic structure seems, seems to be uh, very, um, let's say at the central core of the super solid. But this does not exclude that, that if you don't have a completely periodic structure, but you have another type of rigidity, you might still uh, uh, end up with a system with superfluid properties, but that's not, I think the picture of the of the super solid we were uh, trying to discuss here the year it's very much connected into translational symmetry okay yeah. and then uh, a number of questions came up about uh, of course about roton so uh, firstly again from uh, bill phillips could you clarify what was the uh, color scale in your brag data that you showed about the roton instability you showed dots but there was also some color in that plot Yes, uh, so the, the, color, the color scale is actually uh, the, um, the signal that, so it's, uh, it's telling you about the intensity and the width of the Bragg signal we get. And this is uh, uh, typically limited by, let's say, um, the pulse duration. It's a Fourier broadening. And the dot is identifying the peak position. Okay. Um, a question comes in from Aruku Sanu, who's asking about the relation between the Roton minimum and the Landau critical velocity. So uh, why would uh, superfluidity not be destabilized by the Roton instability um, when the Roton energy goes towards zero? Like why would it still remain superfluid under those conditions? Yeah, so actually that's a very good question. And um, I was asking this type of question uh, myself. And then, I mean, um, in the concept, uh, I mean, so you can always define a, a velocity in terms of the, the slope, uh, or let's say the slope of the, the dispersion relation, whether this is really something you can use uh, as a Landau critical velocity concept, in the case of a modulated state, I think it's, uh, it's uh, unclear. So typically, I mean, the, the Landau critical velocity have uh, better developed in the case of, uh, let's say, the phononic dispersion part. So the law is a more a low momentum uh, concept. How this uh, will then, uh, so we actually try to measure something related to, a, let's say, a velocity and, uh, and the Landau velocity, but how this concept really can, and if they can be applied uh, uh, also to uh, large momentum, uh, this is actually uh, not, not completely clear. Okay, um, John Simon raises a question. So as you know, um, Something like the Roton instability was also seen, let's say, in uh, Cheng Chin's experiments where he was yes. shaking a BEC. And so it, is the physical structure of Rotons the same in these systems? So how much uh, is the structure of a Roton determined fully by the structure of the dispersion relation? So I think that um, the Roton, um, 
mm, simple term is um, an excitation which corresponds to a modulation of the density with the given wavelengths. And now these wavelengths uh, depend uh, uh, on the Hamiltonian in the system. And so which are actually the interaction into the system or uh, the, the, uh, the potential, uh, uh, the trapping potential into the system. So you can create a, a roton dispersion um, by shaking the lattice in, in this very nice uh, paper uh, from Chang Chin. And, uh, and actually the, the, the properties are very similar. It's a minimum in the, in the dispersion relation. And of course the wavelengths of the modulation then it's different and it's depending uh, on, on the specific system. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think maybe I should let you go. There's a number of other questions. I'll try to assemble them for the, uh, for the break later on. Okay. So, is your... Great. So could you hear me or the, the connection was extremely bad? Yeah, we heard you throughout the question. So this seems to work. And during the talk as well, I hope. Uh, there were a, a couple of seconds of lost text, but you're very clearly describing things. So we're all good. Okay, good. Okay, then I go, I go on and um, because now we go in the second part, which is actually uh, really the observation in the experiment. And, uh, and so again, I would like to point out that, uh, that I mean, it was really a very exciting uh, year 2019. And, uh, and we came out with the observation of the super solid state, uh, let's say coming from our Roton uh, result. And at the same time, so also the group of, uh, of Tillman Faud, of Giovanni Modugno. And I really think we, we learned a lot one to each other. So I would like also really to highlight that this type of result have been uh, obtained also by uh, these two colleagues and their group. So, but now going a little bit about uh, the properties of the super solid, uh, and uh, because now I'm just telling you is a state that it exists, but what are the properties and uh, what is the magic you have to do really to enter in this type of phase in the system. So here is um, a 3D simulation of a trapped dipolar uh, quantum gases. And this is the ground state of the system. So the, you have, I don't know, 10 to the five uh, uh, atoms and they spontaneously organize themselves. So this is really their ground state um, in this type of density peak. Okay, of course, I mean, this, the periodicity and the physics itself survive also if you consider an infinite elongated three-dimensional tube. But now, uh, so, but it's also important really to look on how our finite size system actually look like. And so there is two properties which are important. One is that, I mean, it, there is um, a density modulation, which means there is a breaking of the translational invariance into the system. So there is a modulation. And then there is the global, this system as a global phase coherence, which means that there is a breaking of another symmetry, which is uh, the gauge invariance. This type of state, uh, let's say, um, require, since uh, it uh, arises from the competition of different interaction, it really lives uh, in a small parameter range. And so one can calculate the phase diagram of a super solid. And now I would like to, um, let's say, drive you through the understanding of this plot. So this, we are plotting now the scattering lengths, which gives you the strengths of the contact interaction as a function of the atom number here, it's kind of the density contrast. So if you have a modulation, so this parameter S is sort of connected uh, to the contrast of the, of the modulation. So the, and, um, and so if you now have a very large scattering lens or very small atom number, the system is a uniform uh, Bose-Einstein condensate. So that we know in an harmonic trap. But now if we uh, decrease uh, the scattering lens, we enter in this blue region in which the system, uh, let's say change a little bit. And instead of being a, a sort of inverted parabola, it become a very narrow peak. This is uh, what we call single droplet or macro droplet, which have also self bound properties. So it's really the inner interaction keeping this droplet together. 
if now one increases the number of atoms for very small scattering lengths, you see that there is not only one droplet, but you have several droplets appearing. Now the, the overlap between the droplet is zero. It's very small, it's exponentially small. And actually the quantity S is, uh, is more related to the overlap of this droplet. And so in the blue region, the overlap is, uh, is zero. And then in between a uniform Bose-Einstein condensate and this uh, array of insulating droplet, insulating because there is no mass transport between the droplet, uh, there is another state, which is the super solid. And here you see the density modulation on top of a coherent background. And that's what the super solid is. So now it's easy to, uh, let's say, to distinguish between a uniform and, uh, and the super solid or drop it just by using a quantity that tells you whether the profile is a little bit more tricky between a super solid. So in a super solid here, every droplet can develop due to thermal fluctuation or quantum fluctuation or loss of atom can develop their own independent phase. They are not phase locked. And in the experiment, the way the super solid have been produced, actually there is two main routes. So one, uh, it's the idea to prepare a uniform Bose-Einstein condensate and then to tune the scattering lens and enter into the super solid state. I mean, this is a very nice way and the easy way to create, um, let's say, easier way to create a super solid state. And in this way, I've been created in the group of Tillman Fau and Giovanni Modugno, and that also in our group, both with the erbium and dysprosium. However, when you do this, you're crossing a phase transition. And actually, recent work have pointed out that by doing this dynamical crossing of the phase transition, you are also exciting some phase variation into the system. So you, there is some, because when you change the scattering lens across the phase transition, you cannot really go adiabatically. And then there is another way to, sorry, another way to produce a, a super solid, uh, which I like it very much because I was thinking, ah, this will never work, but actually it's beautifully working. You can do direct evaporation. So you start from a thermal gas and then you can simply decrease the temperature as you would do by reaching Bose-Einstein condensate. But now in the parameter regime of scattering lens where the ground state is expected to be a super solid. And so here uh, we have done this type of work with dysprosium, with erbium was not possible because three body losses in erbium for the, the spot we, we chose and were too high. And, um, and now I want to show you this evaporation. So you start from a, a thermal a sample of dysprosium atom, and then you kind of decrease the temperature by opening more and more the trap. And then you see that there is a, a, a little peak appearing and some little modulation. Now these are these, are these little peak. And uh, in our, this first experiment about direct evaporation, so we had a very bad imaging in, the, in, the, in our dysprosium experiment. So actually the fingerprint of uh, super solidity were really all relying to this uh, small side peak here. Actually it was, um, let's say, stay very, Stable uh, side peak. I mean, uh, we also check coherence property. But now, very recently, we were able to change completely the imaging in our system, and we have now in situ imaging. So I would like to show uh, for the first time the evaporation into the super solid, uh, not looking at time of flight, so interference pattern, by by really looking in situ. So now, and in this work, I mean, have been really crucial our new postdoc Matt Norch uh, that uh, that joined in uh, in January actually. So this is an in situ imaging of a thermal cloud. So the density uh, is uh, pretty low. And uh, I'm, um, so the trap is a cigar in this direction here. And this is a thermal cloud. And now I'm just decreasing the temperature. And this is how the um, uh, super solidification, I would say, occur by decreasing the temperature, you see. 
appearing uh, all the different, uh, let's say, array. Now I'm repeating the same video just another time, and you see all the density modulation appearing. And now in, um, you can see, so the 3D reconstruction of our data. So you see this, uh, this state, which is a uh, pretty impressively similar to the ground state calculation that we had, uh, in which you have, uh, let's say, the formation of peak. A bridge uh, in between that is really a quiet ground state. The lifetime is very, very, very long. I'm showing it. These are not. And there's a real data that <laughs> very new from our lab it is very long. One second. Lifetime of the super solid state, but you can also go farther. I mean, now to ten seconds, and you see the after two seconds, you clearly see the existence of this uh, droplet state. It is our hope that Francesca will be back very, very shortly. In the interim, uh, Adam and Dan are going to sing a little duet for you. Okay, Adam, take it away. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for that invitation, John, but uh, I'll spare the crowd. Um, uh, I'll, I'll write Francesca now. We do I can also time. answer one of the questions that was addressed, but I think she would probably give the same answer. Um, Bikram Ramesh asked, um, if uh, the magnetic dipole moment is really weak, why not try to use electric dipole moments to get the desired roton minimum and the dispersion relation? And the answer is, that's a, that's a fabulous idea. The question is how to get um, uh, trapped objects with a large enough electric dipole moment. And so there are, uh, hi Francesca, I'm answering a question for you. There are that's experiments cool. underway to trap, let's say dipolar molecules and one of the uh, exciting prospects of doing so is that they would also develop some sort of super solid uh, phase uh, because of that a similarly uh, strong interaction. Um, of course, the magnetic uh, gases are, are already accomplishing that. It'll be interesting to see what happens when you crank up the strength by a large amount. Uh, but OK, Francesca, what, what should we do? You want to uh, dive back into your slides? <laughs> we were all gaping at the uh, amazing uh, in situ data of the super solid. Uh, one person asks, the real space data is amazing. That's my question. So that was John, but we were all very impressed with that. Francesca, uh, uh, before you put your slides back up, I'm, I'm suspicious that the reason it failed was actually because that slide has a video on it, despite it being a very pretty video. So you might want to start from the slide right after it, as painful as that might be. Okay. Ah, so you didn't see the video. We no, saw no, the video and you were describing working. the long lifetime yes. of the gas and we were sort okay. of losing you at that point. Okay. So now the next I'm... slide and hopefully we'll be right back. Okay. So okay. I'm doing it now again. Uh, one second. Yeah. 
Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get past that. This lifetime? Uh, yeah, that was apparently, that was where we started losing you and you told us about the one second to 10 second lifetime. Exactly. And then it's also, I mean, we are now also trying to play around with collective excitation into the system. That's just an example. And I think we will have to, but, but maybe, I mean, just I would like also to show you is that now okay. we have, uh, do, do you have me? We see the yes. slides, we hear you, okay. let's go. Okay, so that you have the density modulation as I show you before, but still what really allows us to extract the phase coherence into the system are the interference pattern in time of light. And so from the Fourier transform and from the reproducibility of this interference pattern, we can extract the phase co the degree of phase coherence and density modulation into the system. And, uh, and you can also see from the phase of the Fourier transform that the system is pretty uh, focused in phase coherence and each of these dot is a, a repetition uh, a shot. And so maybe here it's where I would like to ask if you have additional question. I'd like to show you just the last part uh, of the talk. Hi. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, sorry. So um, let's see. Um, why don't you just go ahead, because we lost a lot of time, and, uh, and yes. let's just go to the end. Yeah. Yes, okay, very good. So, so far, I mean, in my talk, I was presenting just um, the ground state properties, but another very exciting um, question is uh, how it looked like the spectrum of excitation. So now you have a new quantum state, and you want to know what are the eigenmode of, of the excitation. And, um, and so the, the key point is the one I was mentioning before, is that that the spectrum of excitation it's uh, it's substantially affected by the fact that the supersolid has a simultaneous breaking of two symmetry for each symmetry uh, the emergence of a phononic, phononic branch is to be expected and these have been already pointed out by Saccani Moroni Boninsegni in a soft core interacting system that you should have let's say new branches uh, in the spectrum of excitation appearing because of super solidity and because of the breaking of the translational symmetry. And uh, this is the spectrum of excitation I was showing you. That's a normal unmodulated Bose-Einstein condensate. And this is the, the roton spectrum that we show. But as soon as the roton soften completely, you see that the spectrum of excitation changed completely and you have the appearance of two uh, very clear phononic branch or a low energy branch into the system. One is connected to the phase coherence and the other one is connected to the uh, translational symmetry breaking. And then you have the excited branch and more, and this, uh, the, the, the plot below, so, uh, so the plot above is uh, the energy spectrum in which we uh, plot in color code the strengths of the Bogolube of amplitude, and below is the um, uh, density structure factor that tells you how strong the system would respond to a given excitation at a given momentum. And when you go from a super solid to this array of isolated droplets, the spectrum actually become very similar uh, to the one of a crystal. So you have this band, uh, it's uh, very periodic and uh, the superfluid branch start to really, um, let's say, um, decrease in energy until a point which completely disappear and you have only this crystal branch uh, remaining. All these calculations are done uh, by uh, Rokuzzo in an infinite uh, tube. When you go to finite size system, things are not as beautiful as the infinite one, but I want to show you the calculation we have done uh, in our group. So this is the equivalent uh, spectrum, but for a finite size system in which you have the discretization of the mode and the momentum dispersion uh, due to the threat. And so at the, this is the roton spectrum on the BC. When you got the phase transition, 
the spectrum softened completely, and now you have disappearance of two branches in the super solid phase. And then when you go deep in the array of insulating droplet, it's kind of just remaining the crystal type structure. And I found this really an amazing uh, uh, dramatic change into the energies uh, in the spectrum of excitation, really from a, a super fluid uh, to a crystal. And that you, you see that one can look in the theory and um, the nature of each of the mode. So typically many mode of the upper branch correspond to a motion of a, a rigid crystal, like if it would have been an accordion, let's say instrument moving. While if you look at the mode in the lower branch, instead the position of each peak stay pretty steady while is the height of the peak changing, like if it was a, a density flow uh, between the different droplets. But those are what we call superfluid mode or phase mode, and the other one are uh, crystal mode or density mode. But of course, many of these modes are also coupled and they have both nature uh, together. So it's uh, with Bragg spectroscopy, it's not easy to look at these two branch because they are too close one to each other. And the Fourier broadening, which I was mentioning before, it's actually will not really allow presently us to distinguish with Bragg spectroscopy the two branch. But there is another way to do, uh, and is now to look at this is the mode tracking. So in the Bose-Einstein condensing, you might want to see the quadrupole mode. So the lower slang mode is the dipole in a normal BC, then you have the quadrupole mode. And at the phase transition, the rotor mode is softening completely, and this quadrupole gets very much um, let's say modified and you have the, the different branch appearing. And this is what we have done in our system. We have now, unfortunately the video is not working, but what we have done is to switch off the trap and to switch on again the trap uh, to try to excite the sloshing mode. And, uh, and by doing this, uh, what we observed is that the system have a very complex dynamics. So, so both, uh, I mean, crystal mode, that's a rigid, rigid compressional mode, uh, but also the height of the peak were changing. So in the experimental data that we had, it seems that the crystal excitation and, um, and the, super, the phase excitation were highly mixed together. So we had to use uh, uh, the principal component analysis to try to, let's say, extract which were the principal components. So the, the leading uh, mode uh, determining uh, the full motion observed in the experiment. This was extremely challenging uh, experiment. I have to say that Lorian Chamad really played an important, very important role in this analysis. And here you see um, that, that actually it, the sloshing mode has only one frequency in the BC region. And then when the phase transition is obtained, you see two principal components, meaning two different modes. This one, the one that decrease in energy with scattering lens correspond to the phase mode and the other one correspond to the crystal mode. So this is a, a bit the flavor I wanted to give during this talk by just focusing on the ground state properties and the collective excitation. But I mean, there is much more that we have done um, in the experiment. I don't have really the time to look one question that we were asking ourselves is how robust is the super solid to uh, a scrambling of the phase. So if we create a super solid and we apply a protocol that completely scramble the phase of the system while the density link is still remaining, will the system uh, let's say spontaneously rephase and if yes within which time scale and what we observed is it actually that if we put this uh, scrambling excitation, then the system very efficiently rephase. And um, as you can see uh, from the change of the phase variance already after about 40 seconds. And we have developed with uh, Thierry Jamarki a uh, theoretical model based on the Josephson junction to uh, try to predict the time scale. 
And then there is also high energy Bragg spectroscopy that we have done. And I think there will be much more <laughs> to be learned about this state. An interesting perspective is uh, related to our erbium and dysprosium dipolar mixer and to see whether uh, what are the phase diagram of this system and whether there is some new type of super solidity enter in play in this state or simply how it behaves. I mean, we don't know. And, uh, and with this, I would like to, um, to thank you and uh, also to thanks a lot um, for your attention and to thanks a lot my team because it has been really uh, a pleasure to work with all of them uh, during this year we had a very intense and exciting time and uh, i'm also uh, very happy let's say that we have now a new member i already mentioned the key role that matt norcha have played in uh, in the new result of the in situ measurement together with the phd student max Oman. My team member, thanks a lot for the work and with this, thanks to you for staying with me. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Francesca, and thanks again for persevering through Zoom. Um, let, me, let me try to uh, ask a few questions that have uh, gathered up. So first is from uh, Mehdi Hassan, who is asking about the uh, phase stability of the I guess of the phase measurements, I think it's really more a, a question of clarification. The the phase that you plot, let's say in the middle plot on the top row there, that's that's the relative phase between different parts of the BEC, right? That's not an overall phase, uh, which of course should be uh, you know randomly chosen over U1. Uh, so uh, what we do um, is um, from the interference pattern. So we, we do a Fourier transform of the inter interference pattern. And from the Fourier transform, there is a phase. And this is the phase that I'm plotting. In the case in which you have only two droplets, uh, this phase uh, is, uh, is equivalent to the difference of phase of two droplets. But if you have it more, uh, is, uh, is a little different. So what I'm plotting is uh, the phase uh, of the Fourier transform. And so the main point here is not really what is the value uh, of the phase itself. It's more that each time uh, you, you do a, an experiment, your interference pattern, they look uh, very, very similar. So, and then uh, from this, uh, they have always, uh, let's say the same value of this, uh, this phase from the Fourier transform. While if the system is incoherent, each time you make a, a run, uh, the phase is completely random and can take whatever value. Yeah. Super. Okay, the next questions, I guess, are about uh, anisotropy. So Guancheng Peng asks why the peaks that you see in your momentum space images, why they're always aligned in a certain direction? Why they're always al aligned in a certain direction? Mm, well, I so think the, the answer the is that you're trapping in a trap that is pseudo one dimensional so the trap is a cigar so mm -hmm. is a so it's kind of it's 3d but it's um elongated in one direction it's a cigar trap and so the modulation appear on the weak axis of the cigar great so then i can ask a question that i had it seems like the harmonic trap is playing a pretty big role in these experiments for example in how things scale with atom number um, are there any plans to return to the study of superfluids with box potentials and uniform gases? I think this would be really great. Yeah. Do you know if anybody's heading in that direction? Uh, I don't know if everybody is heading in this direction. I think it's the dream of, uh, let's say, many of us. Okay. And it's just not so trivial to do a box. Right. But yeah. Yeah. A lot of other things are complicated already. Yeah. Um, uh, Wolfgang Ketterly asks, um, so again, this dipolar super uh, solidity seems to require an elongated geometry because the roton instability is inherently anisotropic. Um, the discussions on helium assumed isotropy and the possibilities of a superfluid in that kind of isotropic infinitely extended 3D system. Is there a fundamental difference between super solids in the two cases because of this? 
So I think that uh, the many prediction uh, about super solidity actually, um, so with Monte Carlo have been done in an infinite, uh, let's say, case. Uh, uh, and there are also many prediction about uh, super solidity in two dimension. Actually, this was the initial workhorse uh, geometry for many theory uh, proposal. Um, it is possible to not have, so the super solidity in our case, we have the, the transformation Translational symmetry breaking just in one direction, one axis. But it's actually in principle possible to have it in two different axes. The roton uh, would be, uh, let's say, a circle. Uh, so in momentum space, it's not just uh, two peak, uh, but you will have a uh, uh, radial symmetry of the rotom. And in principle, it's possible. If you do really the, 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 the simulation, you see that uh, it exists in 2D super solidity, but you would require a much larger uh, atom number, which at the moment, uh, I think maybe none of the experiment had. You, you would require, so the, you enter in this phase uh, with, with larger atom number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so Francesca, I think we're gonna uh, wrap up here. Thank you very much for a great uh, talk. I, I can't wait to hear it live also sometime soon. Um, <laughs> okay. Let me uh, now uh, steal the screen. Um, good, so I can announce um, upcoming talks. So the uh, later talks for, uh, for the coming week, uh, on Thursday, there's a talk by uh, Nir Davidson from the Weizmann Institute in uh, Israel. That'll be on uh, Thursday, September 10th, and here's the times. The next VAMOS seminar will take place next Friday, and our speaker will be Anya Jaich from UC Santa Barbara. I also want to remind you that we are collecting nominations for VAMOS speakers. So please, if you have somebody you'd like to hear from in this coming semester, uh, just go ahead and submit that name. That's where all of our uh, speakers are selected from. And then you've also probably received this by email. We're starting to integrate into the series a bunch of talks also by postdocs, and there's a procedure for doing so. So think about postdocs that you'd like to nominate and that we would love to hear from. Also be sure to subscribe to the Vamos uh, email list so you get all of these announcements uh, directly. And then finally, let me just remind you that the post-seminar discussion will happen next. Uh, I believe that there will be uh, in the chat of the Zoom room, you'll find uh, the link that you should go to next. And I think that same link is posted on the YouTube stream. So just go to either one, uh, click over, and you can spend some time uh, chatting with the speaker there. Thanks for joining us this week.